You're listening to Podcasts with Park Rangers, a show where we bring to you stories of the national parks and historic sites from those who know them best, park rangers. Get to know each park ranger and their love for the parks as we discuss history, science, and the beauty of nature from a unique perspective. I'm your host, Lucas VK. Today we interview Rod Horrocks, a physical scientist and the Chief of Resource Stewardship and Science at Carlsbad Caverns National Park. And this was my goal from the day I started in the National Park Service. Uh, I said, someday I'll be a cave specialist at Carlsbad Caverns. Stay tuned. We'll talk bats, cave mapping, and microbial war. There's a war underground in Carlsbad Caverns National Park. Hold on, hold on, not that kind of war. The war we're talking about is microscopic and extends back millennia. Deep in Lechigia Cave, part of Carlsbad Caverns National Park, microbes fight one another to survive. They're called extremophiles and can survive in the most difficult ecosystems. They eat anything in their environment they can find to survive. Manganese, sulfur, rocks, and each other. Constant evolution of defense and attack systems is necessary to compete in an ecosystem with little food. The microbes in Lechigia Cave have changed how we think about microbial evolution. Originally, scientists thought microbes developed antibiotic resistance after exposure to antibiotics. However, these microbes are hardwired for resistance to the natural antibiotics we use today. This microcosm of Earth even has NASA's attention. Scientists believe life on Mars may have thrived underground and could subsist off of the sulfur and iron found in the planet's soil. Mars's ecosystem sounds much like that found in Lechigia Cave today. Scientists study these microbes so we can identify life on Mars when we find it, and so we can learn more about what life could be like on the Red Planet. On today's show, we ask ourselves, what else can we learn from the caves? To find out, we talk to the Chief Resource Ranger at Carlsbad Caverns. Meet Rod Horrocks. Welcome to Carlsbad Caverns. My name is Rod Horrocks. I'm the physical scientist and the chief of resource stewardship and science at the park. Rod is a cave enthusiast and considers caving his hobby. I love caves. I've worked at, this is my fourth cave park. And so I love cave management, cave exploration. My hobby is making maps of caves. He's worked in caves with the national park system for his entire 26 year career. I started out at Tippinogos Cave, went to Great Basin National Park, then Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota, Black Hills, and then here to Carlsbad. I've been here for two years. From a young age, Rod fell in love with caves. I fell in love with caves when I was seven years old. It's my dad's fault. He, he basically didn't let me go into a cave and piqued my curiosity. <laughs> and so I went to a library, checked out every book on caves, and just fell in love with caves. And after college, Rod found a temporary job in the National Park Service and fell in love with the parks. I was volunteering at caves, doing cave restoration projects. I just got my master's degree and was talking to the chief ranger one day and, and told him, well, I just graduated last week and I'm going to start looking for jobs. He said, well, hey, would you be interested in coming working for me for four months and map this cave? And I'm like, okay. Started... Uh, and within one week, I realized this is a career for me. The people are conservation-minded. Uh, you get to go to a national park every day for work. Uh, it's just incredible. And you get paid to map a cave. And so that, that's what really got me interested in and excited. And as soon as I started, I, I realized he'd only hired me for four months. But so I had to make myself valuable. So I started 14 different projects at the park. Oh boy. Because they had never had anybody with geology or paleontology or cave experience before work at the park. 
And so I started all these projects. At the end of four months, I finished mapping the cave and then he did what I wanted him to do. And he said, would you consider being our first cave specialist? Mm. And I'm so like, at that twist point, my arm. <laughs> yeah, you had made yourself really indispensable at right. what was supposed to be a, a four month stint. Yeah, I started my career. Nice. We know rangers in your group in particular are known as resource rangers. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a typical type of ranger that most visitors get to interact with or experience or encounter here in the park. So can you describe the job of a resource ranger, what that entails here at Carlsbad Caverns? There's a number of different types of resources. We have biologic resources. We have cultural resources, archaeology. Uh, we have physical resources, and I'm personally in charge of all of those. And so we have biologists, we have cultural resource specialists, uh, but then we have cave technicians, and uh, we all work together, uh, basically managing anything to do with resources. That's we also monitor those resources, make sure that nothing's changing, and we create baseline data. Uh, we're we're doing restoration work all the time trying to mitigate the impact of early on in the National Park Service, we were all about getting people in the parks and not much concern to what we're doing to the resources. And so now we end up doing a lot of mitigation work to correct previous high impact activities. Right. Yeah, I imagine it's kind of a double edged sword because obviously you want people to come here and experience, but then there is a, a large, large human impact. And that's our our mission. <laughs> it, it is, it's a difficult tight wire rope to walk. We want people to come visit, enjoy the parks, but then we gotta remove as much of that impact and uh, potential for impact as we can, right. and then restore things. We work with researchers a lot who are studying and working in the national parks uh, because people can't just come and collect things here. And every, everything is protected. And so it's a great place for people to come and do research because people don't just come and cart everything away like they do in so many other lands. And so it's a great place to do research. We have wilderness areas that are basically not impacted by man at all. People can enjoy that. Untouched, unspoiled totally. areas. Now, a lot of people come through the desert, the unspoiled lands, specifically here with pictures of bats in their heads. So I'm sure our, our listeners would love to hear more about that area. So how many bats are at the park and how many different species? Well, there's been, uh, I think, 14 different species, 13 or 14 different species hmm. identified. A handful of those have been seen in the caves. Our main bat we have is the Brazilian free tail bat. And that one, we might have 450,000 individuals. Wow. That number of nearly, berries. Nearly half a million. Yeah. It varies from year to year. It goes up and goes down, but uh, that's... That's what that's where the estimates put it. And you say up to 14 different species, but not all within the caverns? No. Just in the area? Okay. We have a fringe myotis that's living in the cave, and the Brazilian free tail that's living in the cave, and... A couple others will spend some time there, but hmm. and then in some of our backcountry caves, uh, we'll have bats use roosting sites. Sometimes it's a day roost site, sometimes it's a maternity site or a night roost. They just they have different types of needs, and they they look for different environmental conditions. So some are just passing through. Others you mentioned maternity sites. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about those. There. Well, we have uh, one. Fringe myota species that actually goes to the warmest and deepest and hottest part of Carlsbad Caverns to raise their pups. Oh, okay. And it's very warm down there, and that's what they want. So they actually fly a couple miles from the entrance to get to this spot. And so when they're going out at night, they're going much farther than our, our Brazilian free tail bats are going. Mm. They live pretty close to the quarter of a mile from the entrance, third of a mile. Yeah. So those are what are most often seen in the, the, bat, the flight. bat flight programs. Okay. Correct. Um, so how, how do we know the, the different species and the numbers? Well, 
uh, we have vast researchers that work here in the park. There's one named Debbie Beecher. Uh, she has actually used a technique we call mist netting. And so that she actually will capture bats. You put a mist net in a, either a constricted passage in the cave, near an entrance, or above water as they're swooping down to get insects or, or to just get water. And so we'll capture bats and then she will identify them individually and then release them. Right. So that's one way we know how many. We actually count the bats. Going one, two, three, four, five. No. <laughs> no. That's what they used to do. Really? Okay. They used to try to just huge count clusters and estimate, of bats. Mm. And they, they estimated that we had six million bats or something like that. And uh, then when we finally started using computers and infrared photography, you can use the computer to count all the heat signatures on a single screen. And it's much faster and very accurate method. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a very accurate method of counting. So we're getting half a million or less while they used to be huge numbers, huge numbers, By millions and millions. Right. We think that the numbers really haven't changed, but it's just how we are counting them is better now. Okay. Right? So a lot more accurate counting yeah. now. What kinds of things are we able to learn from studying the bats? Right now we actually have a uh, group that's looking at the bats uh, and looking at the, the parasites and the microbes on the bats. Uh, there's actually some microbes that are resistant to certain types of uh, fungi. And mm. there's, you may have heard of WNS, a white nose syndrome. It's a disease that's affected bats. It started in the Northeast US in 2006. Oh. It's, it's a fungus called uh, Pseudomonicus destructans. And this fungus has spread from New York where it started and now it's within 200 miles of Carlsbad Caverns National Park. Oh, wow. Okay. And so we're concerned about that. And so we wanted Naturally. to look at the bats and see if they have any microbes that might be, be uh, able to kill the, the Pseudomonicus destructum. Right, if there's some resistance there. With yeah, these. some resistance. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have that. We've had uh, other projects looking at the, the, the microbes in the cave. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are unique characteristics that bats have that no other mammals have that are fascinating to study and make them a, a great point oh, yeah. of interest. What we found is when this WMS hit America, that we really didn't know a lot about bats in America. Really? Not a lot yeah. of people were doing research. And we, a lot of them, we just didn't know what they did, where they went, or anything about them. Pretty mysterious creature. <laughs> yeah. And now we're starting to do a lot more research. Because this WNS is the worst wildlife disease ever to hit America. Mm. And it, six to seven million individuals have died now. And some of the roost sites, it's killing 95 to 99 percent of the bats. Wow, that's shocking. I There's a handful of species added to the threatened endangered species list just because of this WNS. Mm. So it's a very serious threat to the bats. Right. Now, so far, luckily, the threat has not reached. No, caverns, it's, so. it's a couple hundred miles away. Okay. And luckily, our bats don't winter here. They don't hibernate in the cave. They actually go south to Mexico in the winter, which is good. Is because WNS only affects hibernating bats. Oh, okay. But we do have some backcountry caves and some other caves where there are small numbers of hibernating bats. And we're also concerned that conditions could be optimal in certain parts of Carlsbad Caverns for this PD to grow and to flourish. And, and even though it might not affect our bats, they could take it elsewhere uh, as, and it spread it around. Mm -hmm. And we could see it easily spreading around the, this whole region just wow. from our colony. So the colony here, the Mexican... Brazilian free tail. The Brazilian free tails. Okay. Yeah. Those can be seen primarily in the summer, which is when you have your, your bat flight program. April Visitors to, can see to October. Then. And right. those are when the numbers are higher. Either during those bat flight programs or outside of them, do you yourself um, go out and watch the evening bat flights? Oh, I occasionally do. But my favorite is the bat return. The return, okay. Yeah. When, when they describe for us what, what that's like. I think I've, I've heard hints of this. Yeah. Well, the bat flight is basically they're leaving a mass exodus. They're swirling and kind of a 
kind of clockwise motion. And they leave out in this, this mass. And then they go out to Rattlesnake Springs area, and then they spread out over the basin. On the return, they come back one at a time. And they actually will fold their wings and, and just dive into the cave. And they'll, so they'll go in, through the entrance and all the way down to the back cave. And just this, just whew. And if you sit there in the amphitheater in the morning, uh, just before dawn, uh, they'll be just diving past you. They just hear them go, whew, 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 as they're going into the cave. Stereophonic sound. Yeah, it's really side. pretty cool. Wow, yeah, I'd, I'd love to experience that. Of course, that's right before dawn. Yeah, got to get up way early Yeah, to see that. Right now, we have a few bats, a few hundred that are, I don't know, the vanguard group that comes before the main colony comes back. I don't know. Right. But the main colony, usually around April, and they'll stay through end of October. And it's, we're talking to you now in, in March, so mid-March, not high numbers, but still some bats around. Yeah, there's some. So um, going from some of the bigger creatures in the caves, uh, let's talk about the smallest ones, the microbes. There's a specific cave in the park called Lechigia, and that is only allowed to be explored by select cavers and researchers, mm -hmm. but its importance in microbial research is huge. So what makes Lechigia Cave so important for scientific research? I think it's so important it's been closed for such a long time period. For tens of thousands of years, it's been pretty much sealed. In and it was only discovered fairly recently. 1986, some cavers dug through, there was air whistling out between some rocks. Mm -hmm. And so they dug down through the rocks and broke into the cave. Uh, they had a permit from the park to do that. And when they did that, the uh, cave started breathing barometrically. High pressure outside, air would be forced in the cave, low pressure, it'd rush out. And it would come out 75 miles an hour. Oh, wow. And so we've actually had to put a gate on that to excavated space and with two airlock doors. And so now when cavers go in, they'll open one door, close it, climb down a ladder, open the door one, and then enter the cave. So this way you've managed to preserve it, similar to the way it was found mm -hmm. in, in the 80s. In Lechigia Cave, uh, NASA has also shown some interest in the microbes that are there. Why would those interested in the study of outer space be so interested in a cave right here on Earth? Yeah, Dr. Penny Boston, uh, she's basically looking for places where we find extremophiles on Earth. Uh, extremophiles going, being... Uh, these these microbes. microbes that live in unusual conditions. Mm. And these things don't live and the surface where there's normal photosynthesis and other things going on. They're totally in the dark. Uniquely evolved. They, they're that. eating the, the manganese and the sulfur and, and each other. <laughs> so eating the rocks and yeah, they're... and each other. Wow, I mean, they're, okay, there's, cannibals. There's wars going on down there. And what, that's what's so unique about these things is there's one type of microbe will develop a defense against this other type of microbe. So then... This other microbe has to develop a new way to attack. Mm -hmm. And then this one develops a new way to defend. And that's been going on for countless millennia. And so recently we had a researcher named Dr. Hazel Barton. She took some of these microbes and submitted them to basically most of the types of antibiotics we have. And they're immune to all of them. Wow, almost all of really? Them. Immune and to pretty much all most all of them that we've created because, here here on the because they've been doing this for so long sure they've been at war with each other for millennia and they've developed all these novel ways to defend themselves and to attack the other ones mm -hmm. so then we have microbes living along the shorelines of the lakes and the pools in the cave uh, they're in the drip water they're in the rock they're eating the rock and leaving corrosion residue behind uh, stuff that's non-soluble mm -hmm. some of those we call them uh, corrosion residue you can actually stick your hand into the wall. It's just it's like a powder. Oh, wow. They've just eaten everything. That sounds fascinating, like a whole different world down there. <laughs> it is a whole different world down there. I imagine there's a good bit of microbial research being done specifically there. Uh, is there any microbial research being done in Carlsbad Cavern, the big room in those areas? Just in the Bat Cave right now. Just in the Bat Cave. Yeah. Okay. Which is fairly well preserved back mm -hmm. there. 
And, um, so why is it that Lechuguilla cave is preferred? Just because of the isolation that it? Yeah, it hasn't been highly impacted. Right. Carlsbad is pretty highly impacted. Tours, over a hundred years of tours and, and a lot of infrastructure and mm. yeah, 460,000 visitors a year going through the cave. There's been times in the past it was much higher. Right. That's a lot of people leaving a lot of skin cells, a lot of lint, and a lot of hair behind. And so we have a lot of impact on the cave. Yeah, we, we talked a little with our last ranger about that, uh, Ranger Katie. Of course, she emphasized the don't touch policy, but just by visiting there, there are so many people, as you mentioned, like half a million people a year are visiting Carlsbad Caverns. So besides changes in the microbiology from human impact, what other impact? do we have when we visit the cavern? Well, like I mentioned, all our visitors are shedding skin cells, right, right and hair, uh, the tune of a lot. A lot. Uh, just, just on one tour route last year, we cleaned up 44 pounds of lint. In one tour, there was 44 one tour pounds. route. You can imagine, you know what the lint, the back of your dryer, you take a handful sure, of that cleaning out. cleaning out that lint trap. It doesn't weigh very much. No, it doesn't. So you can imagine 44 pounds of that. Yeah. That's just from one tour route. Now, I've year. heard some pretty shocking numbers to the tune of several tons of lint that are cleaned out over a year's time, or am I overshooting the mark there? Because I can, I can barely conceive of just what a ton of lint would yeah. look like. Yeah, no, I don't think we've hit a ton yet. But I think all together, maybe a half ton. I can't half remember the ton. exact numbers. That's a thousand pounds of lint. That's, yeah. And as you say, pulling that out of the dryer, it's not going to weigh very much. As people are walking through the cave, and especially on the steep slopes and stairs, their their pants are brushing against each other. Their their arms are brushing against their sides, and all that is just shedding lint. The stuff will mostly fall to the floor. We build lint curbs along each side of the trail, about 18 inches high. We'll capture about 80% of that lint. And uh, then we'll come in and use volunteers, either using HEPA vacuum cleaners to vacuum it up, or to use little uh, synthetic paintbrushes that have static charge and they can dab the lint and it sticks to the, the brush and we get it off the cave surfaces. Pick that, that up way. without transferring anything to the, the actual formations. And you say it's largely a volunteer effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly volunteer. So switching gears a little bit to cave surveying and exploring, which, as you've mentioned, has been a, a passion of yours since you were seven. Can you describe for the listeners just the process of surveying a cave? What a lot of people don't realize is that a compass will work underground. And so we will actually do traditional surveys in the cave, use handheld instruments, because it's not all walking passage, sometimes you're on your belly. Or... And so we'll establish coverable points at each junction in the cave. We'll take a distance measurement. Nowadays we use laser range finders to okay. get the distance. And quite often we'll even use uh, something called a distal X to give us a compass direction and inclination above or below horizontal. So we take that, and we have a sketcher who's sketching the cave in plan view, looking straight down on top, okay. profile view, looking from the side, and then individual cross sections along the passage. And all that data is put in a uh, computer program that processes, does the trig for us, gives us corrected line plots. We put that into drawing packages, vector drawing tools, and we digitally, uh, we scan the notes put those over the, the corrected line plot, and then we trace the uh, sketch onto the map, and that's how we make a cave map. Okay, so it, it's, it's a synthesis of sort of those traditional sketching plugged into programs, and technology does a good, good bit of the heavy lifting as well. Mm -hmm. I imagine it takes a good bit of time to get to the difficult to reach areas. Do you ever find yourself actually spending the night in a cave <laughs> while you're surveying? Uh, we only have one cave in this park that we actually allow people to spend the night in, and that is Lechaguilla Cave. Okay. To get down to the main level of the cave, it's 44 rope drops, with the longest rope drop being 189 feet. Oh, wow. 
Uh, it's, it takes a lot of effort to get down there and a lot of effort to get back out. And because it takes so much effort, uh, we actually uh, use low impact ca camping techniques in the, those caves. We'll stay six to eight days underground at a time quite often. And when I talk about low impact camping techniques, we're basically, we're changing out of our dirty cave clothes into like expedition weight polypropylene. We'll put a balacava on, I'll put gloves on, and we'll lay down on a, a mat. Sometimes we'll blow a, a balloon up, put it inside our shirt, use that as a pillow, oh. and, and the space blanket over us. And that's how we sleep. And you can sleep six, seven hours pretty comfortably doing that. With very little impact because you're, very you're little basically impact. in a hazmat suit. Right. And we also put, put these uh, sleeping arrangements in where we cook our food over tarps. So we catch any crumbs. We talked about microbes. A single crumb could feed a million microbes. Right. <laughs> uh, Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, so we don't want to do that. So we, we be very careful not causing artificial blooms in the microbe by f dropping crumbs in the cave. Right? Yeah, because that could affect the whole ecosystem down there. It does. Very easily. You, you yourself have spent nights in the cave or you're just saying oh, yeah. that's, that's something? Yeah, several times. It can be pretty dangerous, treacherous at times. Oh, it's vertically challenging yeah. because of all the rope work you have to do. And in Lechuguilla Cave, there's just nothing horizontal. Now you're either climbing up a rope, you're pelling down a rope, uh, on a rope going around the traverse around a pit, climbing up a big boulder, jumping from one house-sized boulder across a 60-foot crevasse to another house-sized boulder, or climbing down the other, other side of the boulder. It's just the whole cave is that way. Wow. It's huge and vertical and and very hot. Echigia is 68 degrees with near 100% humidity. Oh, so, wow. you, so you wear a shorts, short sleeve shirt, and the only way not to sweat is not, not to move. You start moving, you start sweating. It's just <laughs> but it hot. sounds like you have to be very active in order to explore it. It sounds oh, very active. fairly treacherous. What's the most amazing thing you found in a cave? Well, in Machagia Cave, there's a place called the Chandelier Ballroom. Discovered in 1988. I first went to Machagia in 1989. And of course, I wanted to go to Chandelier Ballroom. It's almost become the mecca for cavers. Yeah. And I remember the first time I went there, I sat on a large rock six feet in diameter, and one of these giant selenite gypsum chandeliers was probably 15 feet long, it weighs thousands of pounds, and it came within maybe three or four feet of where I was sitting. And I just sat there and just looked at that giant crystal, and I was just blown away. It was so amazing. The chandelier ballroom is called, it's just a spectacular place. Just amazing. I can only imagine having visited the big room and and seen some of the the wide variety of formations. Yeah, what's crazy about Lechuguilla Cave is it just continues uh, to produce. We continue to we find fantastic discoveries. Just last year, they found a room that's 175 feet wide, 600 feet long, and 80 feet high, and it's full of 80 foot columns. Oh wow! Just absolutely spectacular, and they named it Zion. The cavers that discovered it. Obviously, there's a lot of unexplored territory here, but in your two years here at Carlsbad Cavern, what is your favorite thing about Carlsbad Caverns, the park? Well, in one park, you have probably what's arguably the greatest commercial or developed cave in the world. That's one with trails and lights. That's Carlsbad Caverns. And then arguably the, one of the greatest wild caves in the world, uh, undeveloped caves, that's Lechuguilla Cave. And there's 119 other caves besides those two that we know of so far. We continue to find new caves. So if you're in the cave management, uh, this is it. So yeah, this is the Mecca. Uh, and this was my goal from the day I started in the National Park Service. I uh, said, someday I'll be a cave specialist at Carlsbad Caverns. Excellent. Well, congratulations. I eventually got here. It took me four parks in 25 years, or three other parks in 25 years. But now you're here and plan to, to stick around and learn all you mm -hmm. can. 
Obviously, you do spend a lot of time in the caves themselves. Do you ever take a moment, aside from just the research, just to pause and take it all in? Oh, every time I go in the cave. Every time I go in, I, I find something new I haven't seen before. And, and it's another thing I like about being at Carlsbad is Carlsbad is a famous place. And so all the world's top-notch speleologists come here and study. And to benefit from all the research that's gone on here to read it, it's just amazing. And, and they continue to come. There's ongoing research projects and they're still debating some of the mysteries. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, there's still mysteries they haven't figured out yet. Well, how does this for cave formation form? They're really not sure. Mm -hmm. And they're still arguing about it. And it's, it's a fascinating place. Yeah. And these caves at Carlsbad are different than most caves in the world. How so? How they're formed. Okay. And most caves are formed simply water, rainfall, seeps into the ground, goes through the humus, picks up CO2, forms carbonic acid, mm -hmm. and then dissolves limestone and then deposits calcite in the caves. Which can be a very slow process. Yeah. And this cave is a whole different ball of wax. You have oil and gas fields nearby. You have hydrogen sulfide coming off of those and mixing with the water table and forming sulfuric acid, very corrosive. Mm -hmm. like battery acid. Yeah, <laughs> replacing the rock with gypsum and, and it, it spalls off and these rooms get larger and they grow really huge around here. With lots of gypsum in them, calcium sulfate it's called. Same stuff that sheetrock is made out of. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the caves are very unique here, very different. And then they're profusely decorated with cave formations and the stalactites and stalagmites, and, and the formations are huge. Yeah, I've seen some massive ones, and just today we went to mm -hmm. the Slaughter Cave, yeah. And you saw the, the monarch that's 91 saw feet the high. monarch. It is enormous, and from what I hear, while it's certainly one of the largest, it's not the largest. It's yeah. maybe the largest we as visitors can see. Right. Going a little bigger picture from Carlsbad Caverns to the National Park System as a whole. What's the importance of the National Park System to you? Why is it important to preserve it? Yeah, of course, the National Parks, we preserve America's treasures. That's natural resources, natural treasures, but also cultural treasures. And great recreation areas, it's all preserved in the, in the Park Service. And being part of an organization that we're conserving things is important to me. So it's not strictly preservation. If it's strictly preservation, it would be closing everything up, not right. letting people in. Yeah. It's more conservation. We're allowing people to enjoy it, but trying to mitigate the impact they're having or prevent them from causing too much damage to the, these great resources. What's next in cave research? Bacteria resistant to antibiotics, also known as superbugs, are on the rise. The Review on Antimicrobial Resistance conducted a study which shows in 2050, it's expected 10 million people a year could die from once preventable diseases and infections. Dr. Hazel Barton of the University of Akron uses antibiotic resistant microbes in Lechigia Cave to learn more about superbugs. Research of these microbes can determine where superbug antibiotic resistance comes from and how to combat it. Study of places like Lechigia Cave play a pivotal role in creating a safer world as superbugs evolve. And it's because these national park resources are set aside we can continue to advance science and research. If you enjoyed what you heard, Review us on iTunes or Android to help us improve the show. And for those who want even more content, check out our Patreon page via the link in the description or visit podcastswithparkrangers.com. Stay with us through the final minutes here for a short preview of our next episode. We like to highlight on our show ways that a typical park visitor can give back to their national parks while visiting. 
you heard Rod Horrocks talk about lint picking in Carlsbad Caverns, and how it's a volunteer effort to keep the cave lint free. If you or a group you work with are interested in this volunteer opportunity, call the Carlsbad Caverns Visitor Center for more information. Even though we interview park rangers, we are not affiliated with the National Park Service, and any views expressed are not necessarily those of the Park Service. We're just fans of the national parks, like you. Coming up in Episode 3 of Podcasts with Park Rangers. We visit our first national monument on the show, El Moro National Monument. In this next episode, we speak with Ranger Wendy Gorge about the park's unique history, what it means to leave your mark, and camels. Wait, camels in New Mexico? That can't be right. Listen to the next episode and we'll find out why there were camels in New Mexico.